So last time we were talking about two non-volatile read-only memories, ROM and EEPROM. And before we go on and look at the data sheet for double EEPROM, uh, I want to diverge and talk about a particular application. Typical Dakota. You discuss things in one certain way. Yes, yes, okay. Uh, these are binary decimal converters. So you have n inputs, which means that you'll have two to the n outputs. One and only one output is the circuit. Uh, which output will depend on whatever binary pattern you have for it. So it converts from binary to decimal. So if I have a three to eight uh, decoder, I'll have three inputs and eight outputs and only one of the eight will be asserted. A uh, device usually comes with one or more enables, and so the enable has to be asserted or the device won't respond to inputs. Okay. Uh, the slides I'm about to show uh, are on Canvas. So one other thing I want to cover before we discuss the coders. The exclusive OR gate. the uh, true table. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to partition this. Now above the partition you'll notice that A is always a logic zero. What's Y equal to? Below the partition, A is a logic one. What is Y equal to? Yeah. B bar. So, uh, depending on whether A is a logic zero or a logic one, the exclusive OR gate will operate as either a buffer or an inverter. And that's going to be relevant shortly.
So there is a combination of logic circuit. And this happens to be a two to four line encoder. You have two inputs, I1 and I0. I1 is the most significant bit. And you have four outputs. And so I should only have one of these outputs asserted. Somebody loan me a pencil and pen. Okay, a pencil. Let's, for example, suppose I have one zero for the inputs. Well, that gets a bird, that puts a, a one there. This gets inverted, that puts a zero there, so I'm going to have a zero output here. Uh, let's see. This is going to be a zero, so I know I'm going to have a zero here. For this one, I have a one. And this zero gets inverted. That's a one, so this will be a one. And then for this last one, um, let's see, I have a zero here. So I've got a zero there. And therefore, you see that there's only one output of the circuit, logic one, the rest of the logic. And you can go through and verify for other patterns of 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1 that only one of those outputs should be a certain. Okay, now, the output of those AND gates, uh, each goes to an input of the exclusive OR gate. The other input, to the exclusive OR gate, the bottom one, they're all connected together and they go through this inverter. So this POL is polarity. If this is a logic zero, that will put a logic one on these. Which means the asserted output will be active load. On the other hand, if you make this a logic one, that will put a zero on the bottom inputs of those exclusive four gates. And so the uh, asserted output is a logic one. So through this polarity uh, and the use of those exclusive four gates, you can determine whether you want uh, the asserted output to be active low or active high. Now, this is strictly a combination of logic circuit. And this slide is on Canvas. So, why are we discussing this? For the following reason, uh, I know what the output of this should be. Uh, and I'm going to use a simplified um, table to show this. Get plenty of exercise. Okay, so here's a uh, a table I'm going to put up uh, the inputs are I1 and I0 and my outputs are Y3, Y2, Y1 and Y0 and with 0, 0 that's the asserted output 0, 1 that's the asserted output. One zero, that's the asserted output, and one one, that's the asserted output. 
and then depending on what you have for polarity, that asserted output will be a zero or a one, and the others will be at the opposite logic state. Okay. So, for example, uh, let's suppose I have chosen the polarity uh, such that I get this. That's an incredibly small wrong. That's not 2k, that's 2. By, uh, uh, I'm sorry. It's a 4 by 4 wrong. So I have four memory locations, and each memory location is going to store four bits of data. How many address lines do I have? Two. output uh, this will have a chip enable and I'm going to permanently tie that low so the chip is always enabled now watch what I'm going to do two inputs to my decoder circuit and have those uh, address lines. So for the sake of discussion, let's suppose that's what I want an I0 on. So I want this to be a zero, that's going to be a one. So I'm going to be addressing memory location one. What am I going to store in memory location one? That's where I'm going to put that memory location. So when I want an I0 or 01, I'm going to access memory location 1, and that's what memory location 1 has got in it, so I'm going to get that on the output. Oh, and incidentally, my uh, read signal. Uh, that also is going to be tough. Everybody see how that works? Now, uh, if I continue uh, with this,
covalent part. So the concept here is the inputs to my logic circuit are going to drive address lines. And the contents of the memory location address by a certain set of inputs are going to be the expected outputs I will get from that combination of logic circuit. Very understand the concept. You do the second part one more time. Okay. Here's combination of logic block. I've got K inputs, M outputs. So my combination logic circuit are going to drive a memory chip address inputs. And the end bit output will be the desired output. And so if you define some combination logic circuit, you'll know how many inputs you have and how many outputs you have. You can choose a so suitably sized memory chip to implement that logic circuit. Okay? Now it turns out that using this concept, I can implement any combinational logic circuit using a memory chip. It doesn't matter how complex it is. Because you're going to have a true table, so you know what the inputs are. These inputs are going to select a particular memory address, and the output specified here in the true table is what gets stored in that respective memory location. Um, once this chip has been programmed, uh, these have to be always asserted. And so I can implement my combinational logic in a suitably sized memory chip. Now, when I do that, we give a particular name to that memory chip. We're going to call it a lookup table. or an acronym I expect you to know. A LUT. So a LUT is a memory chip whose purpose is to implement a block of combination logic. You will see this in a future lecture again. Now, just to um, carry on and give you another example, uh, I want you to look at this table.
Okay, so uh, this shows the contents of memory. And the way they specify the address is if you look in the very first column, you'll see two digits followed by a colon. That's going to be the address. Um, now, this goes from 0 to F. So there's 15 rows. The least significant digit is a 0. This is the data, and you'll notice that there are 16 columns other than that first one that's going to get there. And I label those 0 through F. So you have 16 rows and 16 columns. So the way I specify an address is the address of, let's say, this data element is 5. Two. That the labels that you see on the columns will replace the zero. So this one down here, 41, that's at address D5. And so Okay, now the data here represents what you would get from a four bit by four bit multiplier circuit. Now, multiplication can be done strictly with combinational logic, uh, but it takes a fair amount, even for a four bit by four bit multiplier. And we're assuming that these are unsigned integers. So, the data that is stored in the respective memory location is the product of the four most significant bits times the four least significant bits. So let's take this 3C. This is an address A6. So what I'm doing is I want to multiply A times 6. Okay. So let's see what that would be. A is equal to 10. 6 is equal to 6. stored in that location, 3C, 8 bits of data. Sixteen is forty-eight. Forty-eight and twelve is sixty. So what you see right here is the data that I would have uh, for a four bit by four bit multiplier. So what the uh, LUT would look like. storing 256 uh, bytes of data, so I'm going to need a 256 by 8 memory chip. So I've got A0, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, A6, A7. So these four would have the multiplier, and these four would have the multiplicand, and then I would have a V0 
through D7 output, and this will be the product. So in this 256 by 8 memory chip, I can implement a 4 bit by 4 bit unsigned multiplier. Which would require a considerable number of logic gates if you built this up with AND gates, OR gates, and so forth. So that's the concept of a LUT. Okay? And like I said, we will uh, see this again uh, later on. There's a picture of that that's in that file on that pen. Okay, so I want to uh, take a look here at um, what the internal structure of a ROM uh, would actually look like. Down here you have chip select and output enable. Uh, chip select, as I say up here, some manufacturers call that chip enable. Factor. Okay. Uh, the output enable is the read line. And uh, here is your matrix of memory cells. address inputs and you'll notice that it's partitioned and this is completely transparent to you so you don't have to really worry about it, it doesn't affect the hardware design, it doesn't affect the software design either, it's just the way the chip operates. A certain subset of these will go into a row decoder that is going to select one row in this matrix of memory cells. So every memory cell in that row is going to output their data. And I want to access just a single memory location. So the remaining address lines drive the select lines on a column multiplexer. So every column in the selected row is going to output data, and then it's going to select just one of the columns in that row. So you get out here, the output of just one memory cell. Okay. Now you'll notice, uh, here's your data bus lines. These are all driven by tri-state buffers. And if you look at the control lines, the control lines are all hooked together. And they go through, how many data is that? It's an R gate. Okay. So what happens when both of these are low? You've selected the chip and the output enable is low. That's low and that's low. The output's low. That's a active low control. The tri-state buffers are all activated and the data appears on the data bus. Now you can see, and I made this comment before, that if the chip select or chip enable is not asserted, you can feed this thing as many address lines as you want and as many read pulses as you want and the chip won't respond. Because you'll notice that if I'm feeding addresses in here and, and my output enable keeps getting asserted because I'm doing a lot of reads, but I haven't selected this chip, those are all going to be logic ones and the outputs from this particular chip are going to be tri-state, high impedance. So you have to assert the chip select or chip enable to get this chip to actually dump data out onto the data box. Yeah? So to me that seems like kind of redundant. Why, why would you have two, I guess? Because to me, I guess output enable seems analogous to chip enable because you need no. both. I'm going to defer that question. 
and I think we'll get to it in this lecture. We're going to look at a hypothetical memory system for a microprocessor, and we'll see where that chip enable and that output enable comes from, and I think that'll answer your question. So we'll get there. Okay, so that's the internal architecture of uh, a ROM. And from here, you can see the role of the read, output enable, and uh, the chip enable. So now let's look at the EEPROM data sheet. stored inside the chip. Some of them won't even do it in K notation. It'll take the actual two to the whatever power explicitly stated, whatever that number is. I always found that completely useless information. And the reason why is if I tell you this is a 2K memory chip, uh, by, uh, no, let's suppose I just tell you it's 16K. You don't know how it's configured. A 16K chip could be 2K by 8, could also be 1K by 16, could also be 4K by 4. Just knowing 16K doesn't tell you how the chips can be. So this chronic notation uh, is far more useful because it will tell you how many memory locations that there are and how many bits of data are stored in each. Um, so, this is a electrically erasable and programmable read-only memory, which is somewhat of a misnomer because this is not a read-only memory like ROM or EEPROM, because I can write to it. But whoever named this, okay, so here are the pin names. They're going to use uh, CE for chip enable, OE for output enable, WE for write enable. Now, the data lines on this chip, because it will support both read and write operations, uh, is bi directional. You're getting data out of the chip for a read operation, and you're putting data into the chip for a write operation. So they label these I slash O, input slash output. So it's IO0 through IO7. NC is again no connect. DC is don't connect. Now the only the only difference I can figure out between those two is you can hook something to don't connect if you want, but don't hook anything to don't connect. I um, interpret those as the same. Just don't connect or don't connect. I don't connect anything to uh, It comes in two packages, a small outline IC or a plastic dip, oh, three, and also a plastic leaded chip carrier. And if you look at this note, pins one and 17 are don't connect. Uh, there are no don't connects on the small outline uh, package. Notice the small outline package has got 24 pins 
the plastic bladed trip carrier has got 32 pins. Okay. Now this is the point that I'm going to be stressing from here on out is in the data sheets, you need to get in the habit of reading the description section. So this says that this chip is accessed like static RAM. We haven't talked about static RAM yet. We'll do that. Sure. During a byte write, the address and data are latched internally, freeing the microprocessor address and data lines for operations. Following the initial of a write cycle, the device will go into a busy state, automatically clear, and then write the latched data. So, this is a, recall on the EEPROM, you had to erase the chip, and then you could reprogram it. On this, you can access individual memory locations, but you have to erase the location before you write to it. But that's all handled internally and transparent to you because the chip, as it says, will latch the address and data. Now the microprocessor is free to go on and do other things because it's gonna take some time to erase and do the reprogramming. That's all done with circuitry inside the chip, so you don't need to worry about it. So for the read operation, chip enable and output enable are low, the write enable is high, and the data is stored at the memory location determined by the address pins appears on the output those I.O. pins. It says the outputs are put into a high impedance state whenever chip enable or output enable is high. And you can see that here. If either one of those goes high, these all go into the high impedance state. If you're going to write a byte of information, a low pulse on the write enable or chip enable without put enable high, I'm going to discuss that one shortly, uh, initiates a byte write. Uh, there is a way, it says by setting the chip enable low and output enable low to 12 volts, you can clear the entire chip at once, rather than memory location by memory location. Um, typically, you won't use that because in most systems, you're not gonna have 12 volts available. Now, this is interesting. Device identification, an extra 32 bytes of double EEPROM are available for user device identification. So, you've got the 2K, worth of locations that you're using to store data. But they give you an extra 32 bytes beyond that. And those are used for device identification. For example, you may store in there uh, an identifier that says what version of software is stored in the chip. Or what the serial number is of the system it's being installed in. So any kind of identifying information like that that you want to preserve, you can put it in those 32 uh, bytes. And they tell you the uh, addresses, that's uh, 7E0 through 7FF, and remember the H appended on the end tells you this is a hexadecimal number. So when it comes to addresses and data, we're not going to be dealing in the hexadecimal number system. So here is the read operation timing. And again, we're using variables, and so we need to look at the company table. There is the all important. Access time. T 
TACC. Address to output delay. And you see for this particular chip, the maximum is 150 nanoseconds. So your chip enable goes low, your output enable goes low, that's where you have a valid address. And after a certain period of time, the data lines go to the high impedance state, brief period of instability, and then you have valid data. So there's your memory access. Sometime period after the chip enable or the output enable goes high, uh, the data bus lines will again go into a unstable state and then go back into the try state. So that read diagram is um, very similar to what we saw for the EPROM. Okay, here's the right timing diagram. And uh, of course, there's an accompanying case. So in this particular case, um, incidentally, I need to go back for a moment. Uh, it's not shown on here, but the right enable would be high. Not sure why they left that off. At any rate, down here, we're going to do a right operation. So you'll notice that the output enable is high. Get a valid address, chip enable goes low, write enable goes low. I put on the data lines the data that I want to store in that address memory location. And the data gets written in and eventually goes back to IB to state. Now, the important edge here is the right enable when it goes from a logic zero to a logic one. Now, if you stop and think for a moment on the D flip flop, this positive edge triggered, we put data on the D input and then we got a positive going edge for the clock. There's a positive going edge, right? What do you think that stands for? Data setup time. Just like the flip flop had a data setup time where you had to have valid, stable data on the D input a certain period of time before you got that positive going clock edge. Same thing on this chip because for write operations, this edge right here is the critical edge. This is where the data is going to get written into the memory location, so you have a data setup time required. And of course, you go to the table and it tells you at least 50 nanoseconds for data setup time. I wonder what that stands for. Oh, data hold time. Certain time period after this edge. So the Data setup time, data hold time that we have for D flip flops applies here as well. The critical edge being when the right enable goes from a logic zero to a logic zero. Questions on this? differ from double EEPROM? The erases and writes and blocks. Okay. Uh, instead of dealing with individual memory locations, like again with double EEPROM, I'm not going to be dealing with small blocks of data. So let's take a look at a flash memory. And again, flash memory is what you'll typically find in those uh, memory sticks. What happened?
So this is by Micron. It's flash embedded memory. Uh, incidentally, notice this. 100,000 program erase cycles per block. So you can erase and reprogram these blocks of memory many, many thousands of times. And that's typical for the AA problem as well. Uh, you'll get tens of thousands of writes, erase write cycles before uh, the device no longer works here. As a side note here, uh, this comes in two different temperature ranges uh, that are listed as the automotive device temperature range. Normally you would just find commercial, military, and sometimes industrial. They have an um, automotive range that goes from minus 40 to plus 125 degrees Celsius, and the grade six automotive minus 42 plus 85. Oh, wow. A table of contents here for a data sheet. This is probably going to be more than five pages. General description. Okay, so it says that um, this description applies specifically to a chip that either comes in a, a 2 meg by 8 or a 1 meg by 16 version. It's a non volatile memory device. Device is divided into blocks that can be erased independently, preserving valid data while old data is erased. Each block can be protected independently to prevent actual uh, accidental programming or erase. The blocks are asymmetrically arranged. We'll take a look at that uh, in just a moment. Um, now, I don't think I mentioned this before, uh, primarily because this may be the first time that we ever encountered it. Uh, these are all active load signals. Um, you'll see on the label that there is a numeric sign, pound sign. Uh, in a lot of literature, they identify active low signals by putting a pound sign on the end. Mainly because in word processors, it's not easy to put a bar over characters. So, Everybody's adopted the convention. We'll put a pound sign on the end to indicate that's an active load. So, A bar is equal to A pound sign. Now this comes in two configurations, and I have no idea why. Because there's no particular advantage to one over the other. Uh, this shows the entire memory space. This is for the by 8 device. Uh, the by 8 device, you have 2 meg of memory locations. So, you see up here at the higher addresses, you have blocks that are kind of a odd sizes from 64 kilobytes to eight kilobytes. But below this particular address, you'll notice that all of the blocks are 64K. This is your data memory. So you've got blocks of 64 kilobytes. Now this is the top boot block address. This is the bottom boot where you just flip everything around. At the higher addresses are your 31 64 kilobyte blocks of data 
And at the lower addresses are these blocks here of differing sizes. This is the 1 meg by 16. Same configuration, except now they say there are 32 kilowords. So a kilobyte is 8 bits, kiloword is 16 bytes. Oh, I'm sorry, 16 bits. Here's the pin assignments. This comes in a thin, small outline package. Now, this is a very important thing. I want you to look at pin 27 and pin 46. labeled same. On these chips you will find Z ACC, uh, sometimes VDD, and you will find VSS. That's your ground. This is the plus decline. Some manufacturers use VDD, some use VCC. This chip has two VSSs. We're going to be looking uh, a little bit later on in this course in devices that have multiple VCCs and multiple VSSs. Thou shalt connect all VCCs and all VSSs. Do not rely on a single BCC and single BSS to power your chip. If it's got four BCCs and four BSSs, hook them all up, all four of them. And here's the reason why. If I have a chip, and let's say it's got two VCCs and two BSSs, you may find something like this. The multiple VCCs are not next to each other. They're on other sides of the chip. If I hook them all up, whatever current requirements this device has, it's going to be split between these two. If I didn't hook these up and only relied on this, <coughs> then all of the current that this device is going to require is going to go through and out of these two pins. That can create hot spots. But by splitting the current, you tend to prevent this um, uh, hot spot generation. So that's why if the chip's got multiple VCCs and multiple VSSs, connect them all up. This chip, uh, I think, only has one VCC, but it's got two VSSs. They both need to be connected. Now, in uh, these more complex devices, you're going to find in the data sheet a table of signal descriptions. And they will give you the label that's used. It will tell you the type of its input, output, in, out, trace, whatever, and then a description. 
second commandment, thou shalt read all single description tables. And the reason why is they will sometimes put design information there, and this is the only place that you will find it. And as a hardware designer, you need to be made aware of that. So you need to read these tables. Um, I'm just going to point out a couple of signals here. Uh, you see this byte? This switches between 8 and 16-bit modes. So depending on whether you make that a logic 0 or logic 1, indicates whether the chip is going to work as a 2 meg by 8 or a 1 meg by 16 chip. you that right next to the VCC pin you need to put a 0.1 microfarad ceramic capacitor. You wouldn't know that if you didn't read this table because you're not going to find that information anywhere else in the data sheet. In fact that is typical on all memory chips that right near um, VCC you will put a 0.1 microfarad ceramic capacitor. When this, uh, the, the purpose of that is every time you activate the chip, when you assert the chip enable, there's a sudden, uh, a sudden current draw on the power supply. Well, that can cause glitches in your power supply line. It'll make the power supply line noisy. That capacitor will help mitigate that. And that's why on uh, all these memory chips, they will tell you to put that little 0.1 microfarad capacitor right there as close as possible to VCC. They come in surface mount device packages, so they're real tiny, so they're not going to take up much more. Uh, let's take a five minute break.